Hey everyone, and welcome to Political Capital, another week and all the best in news and analysis on BC politics. Thank you for being here. Thank you for subscribing to the podcast, watching us on the free Check Plus app where you can see all the old episodes or on YouTube uh, or in your various podcast streams. Uh, I'm not even going to explain the podcast streams. Enough with the shenanigans with the Tom Fuller. Mm-hmm. we got to get right to the content because we got a lot to talk about this week with McLean K, editor of the Orca. Hello, McLean. Thanks for being here. Hey, Rob, and I agree, no tomfoolery this week. No tomfoolery, shenanigans, or skullduggery are allowed in this week's episode. We're going straight to it. A little bit. A little bit. Okay, fine. Katie Merrifield, Vice President, Wellington Advocacy. Uh, Katie, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And Jillian Oliver is away this week, but she'll be back next week, uh, and we'll be happy to have her back when she's here. So, jumping right in. This is a week in which, in BC politics, we were talking about vaccinations again. Mandatory vaccination rules came in for the first sector Uh, of government. Some private businesses have been doing this, but the first government sector in seniors care. So long-term care and assisted living. We had almost 2,000 people who decided by this deadline, uh, workers in that sector, that they weren't going to get vaccinated. That's around 4% of the workforce. What do we make of that number? And is this, is there anything we can learn by how this kind of first sector is going when we look at all of the other sectors that vaccines might become mandatory in Uh, In the weeks ahead, Crown Corporations, the civil service, maybe even schools, school districts decide to do that. Uh, Katie, what do you think of all this? I think 4% is pretty low. Like for the unvaccinated rate, I think that's pretty much the best that we could expect, quite frankly. Um, uh, You know, overall, I I support mandatory vaccination mandates um, unless an individual has a, a viable medical reason to not receive a vaccination. Um, these, these vaccines have been proven to be safe. Uh, the Delta variant is not safe. And I think everyone is entitled to a safe workplace that's absent of Facebook scientists hot takes. Um, but you know, if the government wants to impose further vaccine mandates, particularly in the private sector, especially among small and medium businesses, I think some uh, for further legal assistance uh, needs to be provided. Von Palmer suggested last week, um, perhaps providing uh, the government's legal opinions to both small and medium businesses, um, so they're not subjected to costly wrongful dismissal lawsuits. I think that would be a good start. And then just a note on the other hand, like it, it's a little bit hypocritical that um, everyone's pushing for private sector vaccine mandates when the government still can't find a way to impose a universal uh, mandate in the K to 12 sector. I'll just include that little nugget <laughs> at the end. <laughs> That's right. It's a good point. You can listen to last week's mm-hmm. podcast where we talked a lot about that, the kind of passing of the buck by the province to all the mm-hmm. different school districts. So you're right. They, they don't, they're not showing leadership on that. McLean, what do you make of these numbers? And just to add a caveat to it, there was a further almost 3,500 people who were going to uh, be put on unpaid leave as well because they only had one shot by the deadline, but there was a lot of last minute scrambling. Those people have another 30 days to get their second shot. So the numbers could have been as high as 11% of the workforce if they hadn't changed it, and now it's down to 4%. Is any of that good or bad or what we thought it might be, McLean? I mean, Katie's right in that for, if it is 4%, uh, that is actually a, a fairly reasonable number. It's a, a far greater number of Canadians and British Columbians think 9-11 was an inside job and, you know, that aliens regularly uh, abduct people. So 4% is actually pretty good. That said, it's going to be tricky in places like long-term care and healthcare, where even, you know, a couple hundred, a few thousand workers, if they have to go on leave or are fired... Um, that's going to be really tough for the for sectors that have been really struggling with uh, with manpower with uh, staffing shortages. So uh, while it is difficult to understand how you could work at a long term care center for the past 19 months and still refuse to be vaccinated, if the the point is those those people are needed in those centers, and uh, if they're not they don't find replacements soon, we could have what is already a crisis becoming even more so. So let's hope this mandate convinces the last holdouts. Yeah. For sure. And and I think the next sector is the rest of the healthcare uh, sector, mm-hmm. hospitals and acute care. Uh, we'll go around again. Is there anything you guys think is the government should be worried about or thinking about as we proceed with what's going to be tens of thousands of people in the public sector uh, pushed into mandatory vaccinations? Is there anything um, that, that there's a risk for government or is it, you know, the government's in line with other provinces and even federally? Is this just mm-hmm. the way we go, Katie? I would just be concerned about uh, job shortages in the healthcare sector. Like that would be the most pressing concern. I'm not necessarily concerned with like 
you know, bureaucrats who can't show up to work one day. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, going forward, perhaps some kind of joint collaboration with the federal government would be of most use. Um, that kind of uh, consistency across the country, I think would be a benef of, of benefit to uh, certain premiers. So yeah. uh, that would be my recommendation. McLean, close us off on this. Any risks as we get beyond the healthcare sector into the other mandatory vaccinations? I, I think the risk is we're kind of seeing a glimpse of this today where there's some two women, I think, have launched a constitutional challenge against uh, BC's vaccine passports. The trick is not to, I, I think the, the, the challenge will fail, but the, the trick for government and public health officers is to make sure their orders are written in such a way that, you know, even a doubting judge uh, doesn't find, a, you know, a, a, an open window there. You want to make sure this is ironclad and that the, the, the reason this is necessary is, is clearly spelled out so that if and when there is an inevitable challenge, and there probably will be, um, that it's, it'll be dismissed and, and or, you know, not lead anywhere dangerous. Okay, let's move on to another big issue in BC politics in the in the last week, and it's on the BC Liberal leadership race, which I know we've kind of lost the thread of because it's not until what February fifth is the vote. But there's a lot going on in the leadership race worth talking about this week. We had the leadership launch of Aaron Gunn. So just to do a quick backgrounder of uh, this individual for those who are listening, a conservative political commentator, 80,000 followers on Facebook, uh, consider him to be a kind of right-wing, maybe anti-woke populist uh, commentator, brings his fair share of controversy to the table with a slogan uh, of bring back common sense uh, in his launch. He opened his campaign talking about things like supporting law and order against environmental protests at Ferry Creek, supporting the idea of vaccines and being vaccinated, but opposing mandatory vaccines and vaccine cards, arguing Canada is not a fundamentally racist country, and opposing the removal of the John A. Macdonald statue, which is a kind of counter narrative to, uh, to what centrist governments have been talking about since the discovery of many unmarked graves from former residential school sites, the history of racism in the country, uh, pushback from him on that. So he's raising very emotionally laden topics in his campaign and the NDP have jumped up uh, and had said that this uh, raises issues of uh, discrimination and homophobia and racism viewpoints in the liberal leadership uh, race. He certainly appeals to a part of the BC liberal base, probably the social conservative part, but let's talk about what we make of his launch uh, and him as a potential a candidate in the race. We'll get into whether or not he's actually a candidate uh, uh, in some of the other questions, but just start us off, McLean. What do you think? Well, I mean, setting all of his stances and beliefs aside for a moment, and there are a lot, and we'll get back to them, but what's unfolding here might be sort of a fascinating experiment that you might see similar figures across Canada try and pull off if Aaron Gunn is successful. And that is, uh, he does have, you mentioned, a very large social media following. Um, you know, however many tens of thousands of followers on Facebook. The, the experiment will be to see if he can convert a large enough percentage of those followers who are not already BC Liberal Party members, get them to buy memberships, and then crucially vote for him. Now, 80,000 members may not sound like a ton in a world where some influencers have millions, but I don't know what the current state of party membership is, but I would suggest that's more than enough to completely take it over. I don't think that's going to happen, but it is fascinating to see if someone who has, I think, literally zero experience in politics is able to parlay a very large and effective social media presence into a real life, real world, you can actually touch it political campaign. Mm -hmm. And those traditional campaigns, people like Kevin Falcon running in the race uh, or other sitting MLAs, they have a more traditional sign up memberships, organize events, uh, you know, go to big uh, rallies kind of thing uh, versus the social media campaign you mentioned of Aaron Gunn. It is an interesting question. Katie, what do you think of his his leadership launch? Yeah, I think the BC Liberal Party has a really fascinating decision in front of them. And so just to highlight a technical point, um, Article 3.1C of the leadership rules, <laughs> this is, I believe, the only amendment to the rules uh, from the last leadership race. It states that you must not be a person whose approval to become a leadership contestant would likely bring the party into disrepute. While we're on the subject of definitions, disrepute means the state of being held in low esteem by the public. So I don't know about you guys, but that is a very subjective interpretation. Um, and who is the moral arbiter for the public, right? Um, 
I think like Aaron is a conservative news personality who certainly engages in a degree of antagonistic shock value to drive up engagement. I think that's a fair way to categorize it. But like going deeper, like does the public see him as the NDP and some BC liberals see him, which is a person espousing intolerance, racism and homophobia, or do they see him simply as a right-leaning populist championing free speech? Therein lies the debate. Um, obviously, as been, has been discussed, Aaron does have a degree of support. If you look at online engagement in the last election, um, he, I think, tripled the engagement that the BC Liberals had and doubled the NDPs. So like, he does have some support in, in this province and, and beyond. Now, do I think that he understands British Columbia and BC Liberals in particular, uh, as well as some other candidates on the stage? No, I do not. Um, and do I think do I think that he could successfully win with a preferential ballot in a coalition party? Uh, like at this point, I'm not sure either. I don't. I don't think so. But do I buy into the NDP narrative about him? No, no, I don't. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult because the NDP have a very uh, at this point, polished and powerful kind of uh, attack machine going, and full credit to them for creating it, that they are going to wail on the BC Liberals as long as Aaron Gunn is even remotely involved in this race. Uh, keep bringing up Laurie Throness, uh, who had some uh, anti-LGBTQ plus rights issues uh, of his own, who was a liberal MLA, who supported things like conversion therapy and kind of landed the BC Liberal Party in... Um, difficulties in the last election over those issues. And then the NDP kind of continue to pick that up and tag the party with it the longer that Aaron Gunn is in. So it, it leaves them open to an attack. But whether anyone is listening, I, I don't know on that. Because McLean, you made the point that it's not about the public in a way. It's only about the liberal membership. The public doesn't get to vote on the party leader. They only get to vote if you join the party and you're a member. Let's Let me run by you, both of you, how this is already sort of playing out uh, on social media. There's two MLAs, two party candidates uh, who have weighed in on this. Uh, MLA Michael Lee tweeted out that Aaron Gunn has a right to express his views, but the Le BC Liberal Party has a responsibility not to give a platform to intolerant views like those he's shared. I urge candidates to affirm inclusive values and join me in calling for his candidacy to be rejected. That was followed by MLA and leadership candidate Ellis Ross releasing an open letter to the party urging it to accept all views and allow guns candidacy. What is that all about and mm -hmm. what should we make of it, Katie? I want to talk about the Lee move. Um, I am a, I'm a huge fan of bold tactics and getting your candidate noticed. Um, so I'm not going to begrudge the campaign for lobby, like lobbing this grenade to get attention, position yourself accordingly. Good, smart, fair. Where I get bent out of shape though, is that the campaign didn't provide a single example to back up their call to have his candidacy rejected. Like I read the letter, not one. Um, and in our coalition, like are we, are we so devoid of morals and bereft of principles that we can't even highlight specific examples of what falls outside the boundaries of our values? Like our NDP press releases, our moral compass now, like that's where I get pissed off. Like, I think a more principled approach would have been for the Lee campaign to call out exactly, specifically what they found problematic. That would have been the right way, the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. What did you make, though, of, of uh, Ellis Ross's response? It just doesn't surprise me um, because Ellis has positioned himself as well as kind of this um, anti woke populist, his champion of free speech. It is core to his being. He's a very principled individual. And so he um, did exactly what um, I think what was expected. He did what was true to himself, which is to stand up for somebody's right to run in this race and test their uh, policy planks and test their message with the membership. McLean, what do you think? Alice Ross's uh, letter was actually kind of really clever and well-crafted in that he doesn't, if you read it, it's being portrayed as he's endorsing Aaron Gunn. He didn't do that. He said that you know, I think that we should allow candidates uh, to be judged on their own merits and allow diversity of views, et cetera, and so forth. It's clearly, a, I think he should be allowed to be a candidate. One of two things will happen. Either Aaron Gunn will be denied uh, the chance to run, which is what I think is going to happen. And Ellis Ross can point to Aaron Gunn supporters and say, well, hey, you know, if you guys need a horse to bet on, I, I wanted your guy in here. Um, here I am, I'm right here. And if he if he does run, then Ellis Ross is still sort of that I'm, I'm carving out that territory. I, I'm the one mm -hmm. who said that you should be allowed to go. So 
it was actually kind of smart. It was a it was a clever response to what Lee did because I think Katie was right. You pointed out on it out on Twitter. There wasn't much value in you know Val Litwin or anyone else uh, after Michael Lee saying I agree with Michael. Mm -hmm. You know, so with what Alice did was something completely different. Yeah, if you uh, my point on Twitter, like uh, again, like go with the tactic Lee campaign, like not not uh, not attacking you for that. But if other campaigns reacted emotionally and said, yeah, this is great. The only person that's gonna get um, credit from a political perspective is the Lee campaign. So it just, it didn't really benefit the other campaigns to, to join on. And I will say, I think like to the Lee campaign's credit, like I think Ellis's reaction is what they wanted. Like they, yeah. Ellis, Ellis has got some momentum in this race and perhaps they were trying to peel away some votes from Ellis that are more centrist. Um, and I, I, I think that's the, the Lee plan is to really position potentially him as like this compassionate conservative more to the center woke conservative perhaps uh to to attract federal liberals back to the party and so by positioning ls in favor of gun that helps extricate that group mm -hmm. over to, to his we tent. used to call those progressive conservatives yeah <laughs> So what what happens now then? And you both sort of touched on this already, but there's mm -hmm. an eight person leadership kind of committee that oversees mm -hmm. this race for the BC Liberal Party. Uh, it's got I think three lawyers and a former cabinet minister on it and an MLA. It will ultimately decide uh, to Katie's point earlier about this clause of whether or not Aaron Gunn's candidacy brings the party into disrepute. So uh, it, by the time you hear this, the party may or may not have made a decision on that. We're not quite sure the timeline. So let's just go uh, around on. What are the pros and cons of allowing, of saying a yes versus a no, uh, and how do both scenarios kind of play out if the party chooses that path, uh, McLean? Well, the pros of allowing him in are they can say to the social conservative uh, population of BC that, you know, your views will get a fair airing. We can't guarantee they'll win, but, you know, you'll be heard. And um, quite frankly, you're also sort of, you're, you're, you're continuing to sort of defend that flank. The, the nightmare scenario for the BC Liberals is that someone like Aaron Gunn throws his hands up and says, fine, I'm going to the BC Conservatives and we're gonna make a real go at this. So that will happen. The, yeah, so those are the pros. The cons of letting him run are, well, we've discussed them before, is that they're going to have to wear uh, not just everything he said, but his reputation. Katie's points about you know, just taking what the NDP have said about him as as gospel are totally fair. But if that is what the general public perceives Aaron Gunn and his views to be, then obviously that's a problem. So there's those there's those cons as well. Um, there are still what three more leadership debates, and you were those views will get full airing <laughs> in those debates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Katie. Uh, yeah, I, I think that we just need to, I think everyone needs to be careful to not react emotionally, to really think about the path forward here, because as McLean pointed out, like the BC conservative threat is a real one. That party is currently a joke. Uh, if you put somebody like Aaron with that kind of digital heft and brand awareness, um, I think that they would be as relevant, if not much more so than um, kind of at the height of their popularity with John Cummins back in, in 2013. Um, and like, congratulations, NDP, you're guaranteed uh, government for the next 10 years, at least if the party splits that way. Um, you know, if he, the concern is if he's greenlit, um, do more centrist members, which we are trying to bring back into the fold, retain or bring back, like, do they get frustrated and quit? Um, and so I think Leoc has to decide like what, what's the worst outcome here? <laughs> um, you know, um, yeah, which, which outcome is worse when we have a significantly depleted membership, we're trying to keep a coalition together, a coalition of federal conservatives who I would argue have never been further apart, right? Like the, the Trudeau liberals are not the same as like the, the Cretchen Martin liberals. So it's, it's difficult. And I will say, like, judging by the background of some of the folks on LEOC, there is a federal liberal majority on there. So that'll be curious to see what the outcome is of that, based yeah. on that as well. And when we hear it, we'll discuss the ramifications of that decision on the show, for sure. Just some, you know, general big picture stuff for folks uh, who aren't in the weeds on this. You know, parties end up, when they lose in leadership races, in which oftentimes candidates come, come in and stress test the boundaries of the parties. The NDP went through this. Uh, McLean, you've mentioned Dana Larson in the past as an NDP candidate who kind of pushes the party a little bit to its extremes and the membership has to decide the future where it wants to go. It's a, it is kind of how this process works when parties are at their 
low moments and their future is being considered and their membership tries to figure it out, you end up with a spectrum of people, a smorgasbord on the table. So it's kind of, it's not unique. The Liberals are unique because they have a big tent of a centrist and right wing and social and fiscal and different versions of liberalism and conservatism, but uh, all parties kind of go through this and then they either emerge stronger or they blow up and, and they have to do it all over again kind of thing. So that's that's where we are. Uh, let's quickly do a hot take here to end the show. Um, back to the issue of COVID. God, what are we going to talk about when COVID <laughs> is over? I don't know because it just takes up all of the space. But Dr. Bonnie Henry is musing now uh, and hinting that she may throw open Full arena capacity, 100% capacity for big sports events, Canucks games, concerts, uh, theater, symphony performances, 19,000 people at a Canucks game. Uh, would You have to be vaccinated. You need to wear a mask, uh, potentially. She's going to decide. Uh, would you feel comfortable going at this point, uh, McLean and Katie? Let, Katie, jump in, and what do you think? Yeah, heck yeah, entirely. I'm vaccinated. That was the point. Bring it on. 19,000 people at a Canucks game, shoulder to shoulder. You're cool with that? Yeah, if the provincial health officer deems it safe we're all vaccinated and ensure i guess we're wearing masks yeah okay. not a problem yep mclean what do you think i think i would go to a, a sports game i would go to a canucks or a lions game a concert in a nightclub i might still be a little yeah i'm not sure it's fewer people but it's a smaller space uh there'll be a lot of drinking and, and removing of masks that might lead to some less safe behavior but again to katie's point that's why we got the vaccines so I, I lean towards yes. Yeah. I hope none of us are going to nightclubs because we're about a hundred years old. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Just <laughs> the, to be clear. <laughs> now they leave they're called discotheques. I think that's that is true. the that's how hip we are. But Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'd be a little wary about it. Just I, it's, it's a hard thing to get over uh, in your mind, that hurdle of going back to 50,000 people at BC Place to watch a Loverboy concert or you know, something like that. But uh, that's what the kids are listening to these days. That's what they're so listening to, yeah. yeah. All right. Just go tech. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go on no context BC Gov again. Uh, but <laughs> anyways, uh, thank you both for being here. And thanks for watching, listening to the show. We'll be back next week on Political Capital with all the latest in BC politics. Thanks for listening.